I need to take this a step further and actually um, do some hands-on scientific uh, work myself because it's I if I don't do it myself I you know if you don't if you want something done right you have to do it yourself so I think that I need to kind of grab the bull's by, bull by the horns and um, <laughs> or something else and really um, go forward so just as the uh, well, I, there's this incredible book about Zen um, where there's a series of ink drawings where the, the um, you know the bull is tamed and the bull is finally conquered um, wish I had that around so I could um, use that as an inspiration or perhaps show those those pictures um, but that's the you know the zen of, of doing and not doing that's kind of uh, what we were I was talking about before let's see if I can find that quote seems to be right here what this is from, from I guess not the I Ching but the Taoist text um, I've quoted it from another author but um, non-action does not mean not doing nothing and keeping silent let everything be allowed to do what it naturally does so that its nature will be satisfied. I think that's um, really great. And uh, it really kind of says, well, <clears throat> the, um, there's this, you know, that, um, you know, sex modes, switching into intercourse mode is, is a natural function and it, you know, part of our being is you know that we are attracted to the opposite sex and there's a reason for that and the reason the is not just producing another child that there is actually um, a reason beyond the reason another reason and it actually puts us in a more positive state of being so yes you know, sex can be a goal in itself and not just a mundane goal it's not just to say that well it feels good and so it is actually um, something incredible, just more than has ever been understood by the human race, at least not in <clears throat> historical times that we know of. <clears throat> there are no historical references to um, sex modes, uh, per se, outright, there are only um, kind of hints here and there, you know, quotes and references, uh, obscure kind of references or architectural forms that are based on, say, phallic um, images that speak of a time when sex was much more accepted and that um, 
it was seen as something much more positive and healthy. And one thing that maybe uh, the science has done it's that on the negative side is that when we became more aware of disease and, and the transmission of disease, um, we suddenly had scientific backing to say, well, yes, yeah, sex is dirty because you can get these horrible diseases and it's the only way for some of these diseases to, to be passed on. So, um, you know, let's all start, uh, you know, becoming more paranoid about sex. So, you know, but that's just um, only one little facet of the entire mosaic or one small section of pieces forming a picture, but the entire picture says a lot, has a lot more pieces and a lot more um, images than our, in our mindset. And this sex mode is um, a new picture. And, you know, I come up with this, uh, my newsletter in essence, which is a free newsletter, and I um, put it around at different um, locations free of charge, uh, such as the Bodhi tree um, outside there. Um, you know, uh, their used bookstore. And you just go out and, uh, you know, get them outside the racks. I just leave them intermittently, but that's that's one regular place I do leave them. They are, you know, uh, what would I say? There are certain natural law. This is in summer fall 1997. There are certain laws of nature and natural processes that are unchangeable by the ways of mankind. The discovery was made around 1975 and is one of the natural laws of nature just as is the fact that the Earth orbits around the Sun every 365 days or so. Um, this discovery was initially called psychosexual selves and eventually termed simply sexual modes. Further investigation found that having sexual intercourse resulted in a more positive state of being that only wears off by masturbation, switching a person from intercourse mode back to master masturbation mode. Um, condoms seem to interfere with getting into intercourse mode while diaphragms do not. And that's um, for the male at least. Um, and it goes on and on. Um, so, you know, I had the book Sex Modes, and now I have the newsletter that's going around. And you may, if this is being shown on uh, public access, um, you may have caught part of the um, broadcast from the future, which was a science fiction um, dramatization that it included the idea of sex modes in a very roundabout way but did deal with the subject and that was broadcast on a few different cable stations so um, you know public access so that probably reached more people than the book or the newsletter combined um, although it was done in a fictionalized way so one wouldn't really know that it was being seriously proposed as something that people go through um, so this is a much more uh, direct um, treatment in the past um, 
because of the very um, nature of sex modes, it, um, I feel that it's unique um, in the sense that, um, you know, we have um, um, a way within ourselves of determining the truth or falseness of this idea. So we are the living laboratories, in a sense, and we can actually verify these things um, in ways that are um, convincing, you know, at least to ourselves, um, in the sense that unlike, you know, um, saying that the um, moon orbits the earth and or saying that the you know some certain nebulae is um, projecting light from a thousand years ago um, you know which nobody can go out and look up into the night sky and verify that for themselves um, it's the average person really can't verify that, but can only um, try to educate themselves about the um, scientific interpretations and data and look for something that they can understand um, and gain an insight into that and come to a conclusion um, based on reliable um, evidence found by investigators in that field. So, you know, it's accepted as fact, but it really wouldn't benefit the general public for a scientist to come up or for someone to come up with an idea that of such an idea and to publish it and try to sell it to the public because the public would have no way of really knowing or understanding the significance or the facts of that. You know, one might uh, find that interesting, but um, it would be very hard to prove it, whereas, you know, the reason that I've really I have taken my case to the general public um, is that, you know, any man or woman can have sexual intercourse with their partner um, and uh, kind of carefully meditate on their state of being and learn to tune into their state of being and observe themselves very carefully and conclude and verify whether or not this is true for themselves and to say, oh, well, wow, I'm really in this other sexual mode after I've had sexual intercourse. And now that I'm in sexual intercourse, wow, when I masturbate, I'm in another s mode. I really am in this masturb masturbatory mode. And, um, you know, is the most incredible thing, and uh, yeah, I've gone my entire life and not suspected this, and yet it's it's part of me. So, you know, there are people who have um, investigated these things and discovered these things, and um, you know, verified these things for themselves. Um, but then, you know. Uh, I published my book 11 years ago and had it for sale in 
several stores in the LA area and gave copies away um, s to some notable people in society and um, kind of you know sat back and watched for the ripple effect and to see what kind of data would come back to me you know to see um, if I would, uh, you know, sit in a coffee shop one day and, and hear some people discussing the theory of modes. Uh, and, you know, there have been some, um, you know, instances that were pretty amazing, but it really hasn't exploded onto the general public, you know. And, um, and I tried to get a publishing deal going and I had a very um, you know famous or successful literary agent and um, she put me in touch with a um, another writer who was going to do the you know some of the work necessary to present it to a publisher and work on a rewrite if necessary but um, you know what actually happened was the deal kind of you know really fell through <clears throat> and it took a lot of um, time and energy and really didn't accomplish anything and uh, it ended up over, uh, you know, court, in court. And even in court, it was never even, the theory was never even brought up, or the subject of the book was never even brought up. And um, it was just discussed in the abstract of, you know, you know this person was supposed to do this and this pe person didn't do anything and you know so it was very frustrating and disheartening yeah this is a great article that appears in the uh, LA Times uh, October 23rd 1997 sex brain cha changes found in rats um, journal Nature indicates that brain regions responsible for sexuality may not be dictated solely by genetics, as some researchers have suggested, but also may be strongly shaped by what an individual does. So, you know, the amazing thing is that um, in uh, laboratory experiments, they found that, uh, well, they took, uh, this is uh, Dr. Breedlove, S. Breed, S. Breedlove, S. I don't know what his name is, his first name. Um, Mark, that's Mark Breedlove, I believe. And uh, what he's done is, in a laboratory experiment, has um, taken the, um, well, he, first he actually, as grotesque as it sounds, <laughs> He castrated the rats, the male rats, and um, <clears throat> and then he reintroduced sex hormones, hormones, so that he could regulate how much was in their system. So he knew exactly what he was dealing with as a scientific. Um, set up for the experiment. 
um, then he knew the level of, of sexual drive that these rats would be experiencing. And um, he then divided the rats into two groups and put them in with female rats. But one group of female rats was a con control. In other words, um, they were just normal female rats and, um, you know, I guess female rats have a, uh, you know, sex cycle. So they weren't in their sex cycle or, you know, they only go in their sex cycle once in a while. So they wouldn't, um, you know, I guess the rats need to, you know, female rats have to be in their cycle for the males to have rats have sex with them. And the other group of female rats were given, uh, you know, hormones so that they were always in their sex cycle so the males could have sex with them and did. And after two weeks, um, he studied the two groups, uh, the group that with the normal rats um, were never observed having sex. And the other ones, uh, you know, I guess had a lot of sex. Um, one critic, you know, described it as pushing the whorehouse, you know, so I guess there was, uh, you know, like nonstop sex. Or, so after two weeks, uh, he studied their brains and he found that in this one area, the which controls the, uh, um, I guess, the, they're attached to the penis from the spine, um, these nerves were actually smaller in the rats that had the sex. And, um, but the important thing is that there was a difference between the two groups. And, you know, then they go on to ex express why they think it would be smaller instead of larger. And, you know, so, but the point is that there's a difference. And, um, I don't know if, uh, is there anything else worth really quoting here that I haven't said? Um, he has certain quotes from other people um, in the article, LA Times article. Um, I'm just thinking I should really look up the name of this reporter. It's, this was on the, on the front page, but anyway. Um, Fred H. Gage, an expert in neural development at the Salk Institute in La Jolla, says... As with most provocative studies like this, it raises more questions than it answers. It says you can't escape, cannot escape the conclusion that ex experience, in this case, sexual experience has an effect on the size of the cells. Um, Diamond, who's uh, Marion Diamond at Berkeley, UC Berkeley said she was surprised that neurons in the new study got smaller. Usually neurons increase in size in response to stimulation. Um, and again, they has speculated that, I don't know if it's in here or the next article, that um, they may have become more sensitive. And uh, I have my own, own uh, conclusion that was actually perhaps they were synapsing 
at a different point along the spine um, in this male rats that had sex, we will intercourse. If you uh, so would think that the Mark Breed, Dr. Breedlove would uh, be aware of the um, you know differences in the um, oh the reflex arcs, which I do mention in my book sex modes um, here's the actual article that was uh, reported in uh, nature and which I uh, dutifully was able to get from the um, Riverside uh, University Library for the um, I believe it be Riverside City College, or I'm not sure what designation it has, over by uh, 14th in downtown Riverside. Uh, so I Xerox the copy. I'll probably zoom in on uh, this little graph, which would be kind of neat. Um, Anyway, the non-copulators and the copulators are shown. And let's see, somati and nuclei, I guess, of the nerve cells. Um, yes, the non-copulators were at about 800, <coughs> and the non-copulators S and B somatized size um, and 225 for the nuclei and the copulators looks like 750 for the somatai, somata and about 175 for the nuclei and this was the Spinal nucleus of the bul bulbo cavernosus, or SNB, and the motor neurons and their striated target muscles, which are activated during male copulatory behavior and shrink after castration unless replacement testosterone is provided. So, changes in the SNB somatai and nuclei are accompanied by changes in the number of synaptic inputs to the motor neurons. An observer blind to group membership determined the number and cross-sectional area of the SNB somatai and nuclei. They say as expected, SNB somatai and nuclei were smaller that in gonadically uh, intact males, okay. And there was no difference between the groups in the number of SNB motor neurons. Um, um, anyway, so the 10 copulator males had significantly smaller SNB somatai a two-tailed t-test and a non, non, nine non-copulators. The bulbocavernosus muscles innervated by the SNB were also lighter in weight than copulators. And in non-copulators, the animals received equivalent androgen exposure shown by lack of difference in body mass or the mass of the highly antigen sensitive seminal vesicles. It gives the um, rates that are about the same. And uh, anyway, but he says copulatory experience can therefore out alter the size of neurons as revealed by Nissel staining 
whether the sensory experience or the motor activity of copulation um, induce these morphological changes interpretations of correlations between human behavior and neural morphology must acknowledge that the two are reciprocally related it is possible that the differences in sexual behavior cause rather than are caused by differences in brain structure so you know that's what he's really saying and it's about well, he's relating it to um does he say human there? Let me see. Well, he's just saying it, and it could relate to people. And further up, in the beginning, he actually says um, he relates it to human brains. He says reports of mor morphological differences between the brains of humans with different sexual orientation or gender identity. I mean, gay people hmm, have further speculated that such behaviors may result from hormonal or genetic influences on the developing brain. In other words, that gay people, you know, have a genetic difference in different brain elements or different brain, you know, variations and chromosomes, etc. However, the causal chain may be reversed. The sexual behavior in adulthood may have caused the morphological differences. Love's um, article here in uh, Nature. Oh, he has some charts. In his charts where he's showing the, um, the differences in size of the um, motor neurons. <coughs> Under figure one, he says, uh, says sexual experience alters neuronal morphology. And uh, I find that very interesting because, um, you know, I've been saying sexual intercourse, which is male neural function, and it's almost, um, you know, the same meter and... <coughs> length, it's almost, almost the same lyric, you know, if you were considering songs, you know, and, you know, you know as I, I kind of shorten it simply to say sexual intercourse, which is neural function, but uh, I just, I think it's just so amazing that, uh, you know, it's, it's so significant that uh, this research has come to light, and that, uh, you know, those who follow the concept of mass and sexual modes, um, you know, we now have uh, science, hard scientific evidence to back us up. Um, the Times article um, also quotes um, well, there's a uh, this is William T. Green, Greeno, an authority at University of Illinois on the neurobiology of learning. <clears throat> um, he says, quote, you can't escape the conclusion that in experience, in this case sexual experience, has an effect on the size of the cells. There are you know, many other um, scientists quoted that all seem to uh, corroborate this. Uh, you know, and, uh, uh, so it's it's you know this is kind of a, a hailed um, discovery. And it's uh, you know making waves in the scientific community, and it uh, it certainly. Uh, tends to strengthen rather than weaken the, the case of sexual modes. This kind of gestalt, you know, the, the idea of gestalt is that um, the sum of the parts is, is 
greater than the parts. So if you take this as a, I believe Sartre's example or someone's example, um, you take four sticks and you attach them to a square piece of wood and you um, attach a, another square piece of wood, you know, perpendicular to the first piece of wood, you don't just have two square pieces of wood and four sticks, you have a chair, and a chair is suddenly this amazing thing that's just, you know, you say chair and it just sticks in your mind, suddenly you have an image and it's something like an archetype, just, um, all you have to do is say chair, and people imagine sitting in chairs, and they see an image of chair, um, maybe a chair that they have, or a famous car, you know, beautiful carved antique chair, but you just say chair, whereas, <laughs> you know, so it's greater than the sum of the parts, it's this great thing, so, you know, knowing something um, is kind of the same way, and modes are kind of the same way, even though, you know, there's some shift, perhaps in the, um, you know, I don't know, could be, I think I just write, write something about the anterior thalamic nuclei um, being, uh, so it, it could be in the anterior thalamic nuclei, or and it could be in the, you know, the way the um, certain blood vessels dilate, or certain, uh, you know, hormones are changed in, in secretion. But then these little factors put together make this incredible change wash over us so that we're a different person. You know, we really act and think, and even our reflexes and sleep patterns are affected, our dreams, all these things are extremely different. So, you know, that is, um, that is, uh, you know, incredibly uh, profound. That uh, you know relates, shows, also this kind of shows the um, how some statement about you know the very real way the saying say in intercourse mode. Um, sunset just becomes extremely captivating and you just want to sit and gaze at the sunset where I, whereas um, you know in uh, masturbation mode uh, you see the sun going down but perhaps you just say well no I just want to take a nap or I just want to uh, you know start reading my book before it gets too dark you know or vice versa, but, you know, these seem like kind of trivial things, but they're actually, um, you know, symptomatic of these profound changes. So, So I hope that um, eventually, um, in the future, more evidence will come out and uh, modes can be proven, you know, without a shadow of a doubt. Uh, hopefully then it'll be a new world. And uh, we 
can actually begin to um, discover the secret of modes. And, you know, I see really a future society where people are in intercourse mode whenever they want. And if they want to be in intercourse mode all the time, um, then they will, and it won't be an issue. And some people will really have a lot of um, inspiration and energy and, you know, portions of the human race <coughs> will be um, eff affected positively. And um, you, know, you may see a group of people, um, you know, going off into the woods and building a um, incredible structure, say a pyramid or just some incredible sculpture, just because, you know, just because they're celebrating life and it's so wonderful and they make friends with all the animals and they um, set up tents and they play music and they just have an incredible utopian time and, uh, you know, these things could spring up everywhere and, uh, you know, that's um, the vision of the future that I would like to see and I'm hoping that um, I'll live to see some of that and that uh, you know because of modes um, this stuff is actually not just a dream you know we have these wonderful dreams and we try to make them into reality um, by doing outward physical things. Um, but it doesn't always work out to be the reality once we do these things. You know, we build a wonderful shopping center and uh, condominium complex and people move in but in s and in, you know suddenly their payments are so high and they're um, you know they're worried about this, their kids in school who aren't doing that well and getting um, maybe in trouble and uh, disobeying their parents you know and uh, you know it's just like a um, a facade, you know, and uh, the inner reality is not living up to the outer um, expression or the outer um, appearance. So, in many ways, uh, society is putting on a happy face and it's really remains for a lot of improvement to be accomplished and um, hopefully um, this can be really accomplished. So the inner being will be changed and just as you can, um, you know, I think the uh, the uh, great sculptors of the past, um, you know, would build these monuments to the gods in hopes that the gods would be pleased and if they could only build a big enough um, statue, then it would become alive or it would bring prosperity 
and everything would be wonderful. And, you know, I tried that. And, um, you know, in some ways, it's like building the shopping center. Your life may have been rosier and seemed rosier, you know, and, but again, you know, you, you have to change within, you know, there are inner changes, and that's what the mode idea is, that there, you know, we, that kind of Western society has really been, um, creating all these technological advances um, to make us happy and to entertain us. But there's, um, you know, if you're, oh, I think there's a John Lennon song that says, um, you know, you can you can paint your face with a smile, but, you know, one thing you can't hide is when you're crippled inside, and I think that's, uh, you know, in a lot of ways we are crippled inside, and, um, you know, I think that uh, sex modes is really an important answer, and, uh, you know, there may have been societal conditions in ancient times before there were widespread um, venereal infections and people kind of had orgies and celebrations and, you know, got drunk and made love under the moon and uh, everyone was happy, you know. There was enough... Uh, fruit to pick, and, uh, you know, wildlife was just brimming everywhere. There was always food and drink, and, um, life was just uh, a great celebration. I think that's, uh, what we could get back to, you know, in the long run. Um, but it's going to take modern science to do it because we're going to have to battle uh, these diseases and discover um, what the key is to sex modes and, um, you know, create a, um, a sex mode machine or some device or way of um, recreating I I intercourse mode and, um, you know, really discovering the whole thing and what the keys are, the keys to the locks. You know, we've, I've outlined the locks and found a few keys in the way of what I've term sub-modes and perhaps the c condition of DIS and how to combat and correct it. Um, but again, this is um, right now as far as society goes, this is all um, speculation and all theoretical and it needs to really be worked out in total detail um, so that um, it's just so precisely um, elucidated that um, there's no doubt. And, um, you know, the, the truth of the matter can be verified um, by any scientist and I the
stop waiting for something and, and um, I think that in just sitting back I'm not that was one way of doing that but I think another way of doing that is to fulfill the natural function of the birth of this knowledge and acting as the um, kind of the delivering, helping to deliver the child because sometimes there are certain obstructions and certain um, problems in the birth process so I can act as the um, what would that be obstetrician um, so and um, to bring out the child that is crying to be born And I even um, use that metaphor in my book. I talk about uh, <clears throat> the cat is out of the bag, or the uh, you know once the uh, the baby is you know coming out of the womb, it's it's too late to uh, for an abortion, or it's you know I say it's too late to push. You know, you can't push the baby back in. You have to assist the baby in being born. So, and the birth of a child is very painful for the mother. So, one can um, draw the um, similarity between um, the allegory or the comparison. Uh, say, Mother Earth or humanity is the mother. And um, this mode idea is the child. So, you know, to facilitate the growth and spreading of this knowledge is only going to help the mother, you know. And the mother will be very grateful once the child is seen to be healthy and happy. And um, so... Know, humanity and will be very happy to once they see that this is a good thing which um, I definitely believe is and so you know that the world will be a better place and you know, humanity will go forward and be able to discover more um, as I discussed before, the um, uh, modern science and technology has created this external world for us, which is very fun and uh, entertaining, and especially with computers and the uh, World Wide Web, the computer is just... Um, even more amazing than the television and uh, you know this is kind of the latest gem in the crown of modern western civilization as western civilization is now actually all over the world you know the technological revolution um, but there's you know, the East <coughs> has, was concerned with meditation and was known for its philosophical and metaphysical systems that really went within. And so, um, you know, inner peace was seen as a very important goal. And so the West went through the external and the east went through the internal but somehow modes kind of slipped through the cracks the idea was never really um, came forth 
And so somehow this is a kind of rebirth of the internal that we really can study our internal states um, and our shifts in consciousness. So we have to become more aware of our consciousness. And that's something that's kind of alien to uh, the modern society we live in. We kind of tend to want to bombard our senses and just to um, distract ourselves. And if we do, you know, um, become aware of ourselves, it's sometimes it's just um, to um, say we're angry or not, you know, not really why we're angry or to really, um, you know, go deeper into deeper and deeper levels and break through to deeper levels and to really get into the, you know, the core, our core. Um, so, um, from the standpoint of the physical sciences, you know, we've, we're used to saying, well, you know, we um, look out into the universe and try to discover the universe, and then looking within, we grab a microscope and try to discover the, you know, the DNA code. And, but, you know, there are ways of looking out into the universe um, and within um, from a consciousness standpoint. And I think that that's, you know, we can go into the consciousness standpoint without just saying, well, um, okay, we're going to meditate and try to, um, you know, develop our, say, our psychic powers or try to, um, you know, see our soul or learn to go to spiritual realms. <coughs> you know, again, that's a legitimate kind of activity <coughs> as I see it. But, um, you know, and again, I think, you know, I've, that's been something I've really been interested in. But, um, you know, the mode idea is that there's this, this kind of uh, unknown land that we have no, no, or very little knowledge about, and I'm kind of the, I'm the, um, Christopher Columbus of that uncharted land, um, in my video movie broadcast from the future, um, the alien scientist from the future says this is broadcasting live from that enchanted continent in the sky, and I guess the the uh, idea of modes could be that enchanted continent, and I'm the, um, I'm the person in the um, video, the alien scientist is the explorer, the person who knows about it, and in the same way, I'm the authority, and I'm the, uh, the one who's kind of come back from the uh, investigation and trying to um, spread the word about it. And so...